Hello, my name is Ed Walker. I'm the technical manager at the Cornish Lime Company and I am here today to give a talk on standards and materials testing in relation to modern limes sold on the UK and EU markets. Now, the first standard that anybody's going to think of when you talk about lime is going to be the lime standard itself, the N459. This standard is split into several parts, the first part being the specifications and conformity criteria. This is the section of the standard where it breaks down the types of lime that you can put on the market and the test methods that you need to in order to be able to QA your product. The other parts of the standard are usually the test methods which uh, are for the aforementioned types of lime. Whilst this does cover the binders themselves, it doesn't really give you any idea of the mortar or render performance of these types of limes. Now, this is covered by a different standard altogether, EN998. So what I will do today is I will cover both of these in different parts because it will give you an overview of how some of these things are are different and how some of these things have some, some quite distinct limitations in, in both their test methods um, and how the, te the, the results can be applied. Now, whilst um, 998 is typically for dry mixed mortars, uh, seeing as 92% of the current new build mortar market is for dry mix mortars and lime mortars are getting more and more common as people are looking for eco build or low carbon construction it is one where EN998 will become a lot more common uh, for people working in this industry as well as a standard which you will need to be familiar with. As I started to drill down into the applicable list of standards that could be uh, useful within both heritage and new build construction, I came across a plethora, a never-ending list of different types of standard. Now, because of the vast, vast array of different materials here and different types of, of standard and, and specification standards and test standards and everything else that's under here, um, I've just decided to keep it very simple and just go down to just a couple of them that we can have a look at in a little bit more depth. So starting on EN459, it classifies lime into um, three main categories. You have air limes, you have uh, natural hydraulic limes, and you have the two artificial hydraulic limes, both formulated and hydraulic limes. Now, air limes typically are tested chemically. However, the other three are usually tested through mechanical means as well. Now, looking at how this mechanical strength testing is undertaken, uh, you take your binder and you use an artificially graded sand which is mixed at pretty much one to one which is then placed into some molds and then dropped on a, a reciprocating arm in order to remove as much air as possible these bars are kept at high humidity and then they are demolded and placed into a rain chamber um, obviously this is only looking at the hydraulic element of these binders as a rain chamber is not particularly conducive for carbonation being too wet. Um, the biggest issue I think with this stand is that you can't actually compare between brands if you're looking at the mechanical strength that comes out the other end and this is due to the varying chemistry of the binders. Now if we take a couple of the more common um, NHL binders currently on the market, if you take Sanastia's NHL 3.5 for example, it is predominantly a mix of dicalcium silicate and lime. Now, disocalcium silicate has a very, very slow strength development. And if you're looking at your 28 day mark here, to start with, it's obviously nowhere near the final set and hardened strength of your material. But secondly, it's very different to the other lines on the graph here. If you were to take Otterbein NHL 3.5, for example, whilst it does have dicalcium silicate in it, it also has tricalcium aluminate, which means that your initial strength, especially across your early period, will be quite considerably different to what Sanastier's lime is. To muddy the waters even further, if you were to then take a HL, which is a blend of Portland cement and usually hydrated lime, then you'd be following this curve instead. So here is your seven day and here is your 28 day mark. Now this is obviously quite a considerable change compared to what might be more common for a hydraulic lime. So even within the same strength classification, it's not really possible to compare, but especially between the different classifications, it you can't compare them at all. Now, this is because these standards are actually designed around manufacturing. It does kind of mean that these classifications are somewhat meaningless to the end user. Whilst they are tested in 
almost the same way, they can't be compared at 28 days at all. A common complaint that I hear quite a lot with the EN 459 standards is actually the overlap between the classifications. Now, I actually don't have that much of a problem with the overlap between the classifications. The reason for this is that, if you, especially if you're dealing with a natural hydraulic lime, it is somewhat variable being a natural product. As a result, you form a bell curve of strength results. You'll never hit the same strength time and time and time again. So what happens is that this bell curve will fit best into one of the NHL strength categories. And uh, manufacturers are externally assessed to make sure that this is this methodology is basically being followed. Um, they will have unannounced spot checks through the year by their assessors. Um, it's not something I think a lot of them are particularly happy about, if I'm honest. Having somebody turn up at your laboratory to make sure that you're actually doing what you say you're doing uh, is can could, could become cross as insulting. Um, but more than anything else, the actual methodology itself, it's not ideal. Um, but they are forced to work with it. Something that I do ask get asked very, very commonly, and by commonly I mean probably more than 20 times in the last six months, is can we please make a very low strength binder, preferably as a formulated line with a POSLAM? The short answer is, we'd like to. The longer answer is, the standard itself that would probably not uh, allow for it because we'd be trying to make something which is too low in strength. The other side of it is that the cost to get all of the paperwork and the machinery and the new laboratory in place would be ex extraordinarily high and far, far beyond anything we'd ever make from it in sales. Now, somewhat perversely, we can't, whilst we can't supply this as a binder, we can actually sell it as a ready mix mortar. This is because there are no restrictions on the strength when you're making a mortar, and the use of a POSLAN would actually be a modification of the mortar rather than a binder. So, whilst I do get asked this very commonly, um, it is one where unfortunately we can't make FL binders to, to the very, very low strength specifications that we have been asked for. Moving on to mortar testing. EN1015 is the suite of tests which are applicable to the specification standards for mortar and render, uh, which are EN998 parts 1 and 2. Now, the EN1015 suite of tests are very explicitly designed around Portland cement type products. To give you a brief taste of that, any, any mortar with a hydraulic binder and that is a very broad term, hydraulic binder, uh, uh, would be tested the same as a 116 or more cement rich mortar. So even if we were to make and get classified a material which was an ultra low strength material, it would be tested in the, under the same methodology as a Portland cement mortar of 116 or stronger, even though there are those which are weaker, obviously, listed below. To give you an overview, very brief overview on how mechanical strength testing works, you form uh, a prism, a three gang prism. They are cured for 28 days, seven days at a 95% plus relative humidity, and then 21 days at a quote dry cure. This is at 65% relative humidity. The entire time the bars are maintained at 20 degrees. The bars are then taken, they are flexed in a jig, which roughly snaps them in half to give you a flexural strength. And if you've got good enough equipment, it can also give you a modulus of elasticity. And then each half of the bar is crushed in a different jig. That crushing of the half is your compressive mechanical strength. Now, unfortunately, in this country and in Europe, uh, strength of a mortar is it has been related to the durability of a mortar. Now, I think the vast majority of the people in this room who have ever worked with anything more than a couple of hundred years old, especially going back to even the, the those which are thousands of years old, your Romans, your Greeks, your Mesopotamian, all of the weird and wonderful mortars from around the world, which were either earth, lime, or something in the middle, uh, they, they would never have hit the kind of strength that you see in, in modern construction. And I mean, being in Cornwall or from Cornwall, uh, we come under a very severe classification, so we are an M6 minimum strength for an external render. Now this becomes a problem for us because when we go back to the strength type graph here, whilst your Portland cement mortars could easily hit your M6 type classification, if you're dealing with a hydraulic lime which is tested at 28 days, 
even at a perfectly wet cure, you would never actually hit the kind of strengths required because these are pure binder pastes that are being tested here. So with an ex whilst the strength development carries on over time, that is not considered by the standard, which is a bit of a pain and a bit of a problem and hopefully will be addressed when the standard actually comes up for revision next. To look at some of the other issues with the strength testing standards, the bars which are being formed are formed at 40 mil. Now, nobody builds anything with a 40 mil joint. On top of that, every single background that you'd be applying a render to or that you'd be building a wall with will have some degree of suction. Now, that's not the case for solid steel bar molds. And this actually is a very important point for one very distinct reason. This changes the water binder ratio of the final hardened mortar. And as a consequence, everything from your strength to your density, to your pore structure, to your capillary water absorption, your water vapor permeability, pretty much every set hardened um, category measure measurement of a mortar or render that you would test will be changed in situ compared to a laboratory result made in a steel bar mold. Going on to water absorption, as obviously water absorption was just covered in the last one very briefly, you form the bars in pretty much the same way, you snap them in half, you take the broken face and you submerge it in water, and you test this for a 90 minute period to see how much is absorbed. These bars are weighed at nine, 10 and 90 minutes. Again, you have the issue here of um, the suction from no suction from the bar mold creates an unrepresentative pore structure. On top of that, the needle floating is pretty much the only way that you would get as rough a finish as a broken bar face, and it's not very commonly done. The biggest problem with this test when you're dealing with lime mortars is the majority of the time the test actually fails. You wind up with a saturated bar. This actually defeats the point of the test. If you're supposed to be measuring a water absorption over time, but your uh, your bar gets to the point where it can't absorb water because there's no space left for the water to go, then you're not actually measuring water absorption over time anymore. A number of companies have actually started um, noting the point at which the bars are getting saturated because then at least it gives you a decent method for comparison between different mortars. Because what you can find is that you get to the end of a test and you can have two mortars which give you the same number at the end of the test. However, you can wind up with one which is saturated in 20 minutes and one which is saturated in about 80 minutes. And obviously they do have quite considerably different water absorption rates there. Now, last time I gave this presentation, this is a very polite version of how we asked for it, uh, this question, but uh, I was asked, what's the point in any of the standards? They seem like they're all a bit of pointless and a bit of a waste of time. Quite honestly, the standards which are covering the vast majority of these materials and um, the test methods and all of those kind of things are not designed for the vast majority of people who are going to be watching this presentation. They are designed for manufacturers and only for manufacturers. They allow CE marking or now UKCE marking of a product to be placed on the market. You cannot place a product on the market without a specific exemption unless it is CE marked. These standards are not about measuring performance. They are for testing for consistency of a manufactured product. Now, this becomes a problem when these standards are being used for specification because it is being taken for granted that these are, are, are measurements of performance of a mortar. Now, to be completely fair, if you do understand the methodology, the assumptions, the limitations behind the tests, then you can take these results and you can use them as a yardstick to give a comparison between the different materials. So to give the, the one I gave a minute ago on the water absorption test, you can have a material which saturates in 20 minutes and a material which saturates in 80 minutes. You can, in real life, say, in all likelihood, the one in 20 minutes, even with an enhanced water binder ratio, will still be more porous. However, you must understand that those figures that you're reading are not what you're going to achieve in real life. Companies who manufacture these products are required to have an externally audited factory production control system, regardless of the level of testing that they are required to adhere to. Now, 
This is typically done through ISO 9001, which is why you'll find that pretty much every manufacturer has it. Uh, however, it is one where the different levels of testing can give you different levels of difficulty. So binders, for example, um, will have a, a, a more thorough inspection because they will actually have to have a second set of inspections, which is how you wind up with your random spot checks through the years. Now, as a specifier, what do you do with this information? Because everything that I've just told you basically tells you that you can't use any of the results that you get given by a manufacturer. First off, don't panic. As I've said, so long as you understand that these results can be used as a yardstick, but are not what you get in real life, you're halfway there already. Think critically about any declared results. Do you trust the company? Does this test data fall within what you might expect to see? Sometimes you can come across unusually good figures, and I am very pointedly putting good in quotation marks there, depending on what you're looking at. Now, the reason that um, sometimes people will ask for independent test data is because sometimes it is available. Within this industry, because we are still a relatively niche industry at this point in time, it's very uncommon to get independent test data. So as a consequence, it can be quite difficult to get actual realistic figures on a product. The worst examples of this are, are actually uh, insulation products. If you don't have any independent test data from an insulation product, especially as a render, then I would definitely avoid it. Now, whilst the declared figures are not a real life measurement, like I said before several times now, you can use them as a proxy, you can use them as a yardstick, but you do need to understand some of the limitations here. So as a consequence, a bit of light reading and some homework, I would recommend going and reading the standards. It goes a very long way towards helping the understand some of the limitations on these methods. And when you start to learn about the limitations, it will help you do specifications better based on the information which is available to you. And finally, ask somebody who regularly works with the standards. This is a relatively small industry. As a consequence, I'm sure you've probably got somebody's phone number who you could just ring up and ask the question of this. The other part of that um, is that if you do come across a figure and you can't work out why it is unusually good, just ring people, f uh, find out why. It's sometimes quite good to talk to, I don't know, maybe a competitor of somebody who manufactures a product because you can, very, you can usually get a response out of them why their figure might be unusually good. Now, that was a very, very brief overview looking at some of the, um, some of the pitfalls, the common pitfalls that are... Uh, I come across on a day in day out basis working with both these standards and specifiers um, and obviously there are many many others that I haven't covered here today. Now whilst this is a very expansive and very complicated topic it is one where uh, with a little bit of research yourself you can go a long way to answering a lot of the questions that you might have in the back of your head and getting hold of a copy of the standards and having a quick read through them is a very good way to start. Um, I believe we're doing questions at the end of the recorded section, uh, so uh, if you do have anything, then obviously please ask. Thank you very much.